Okay, um, if you look at chapter 11, um, we are retold the story of Damu's exploits once again. And you might want to think about the significance of the repetition of retelling the same event. Why are we told this numerous times? What is the significance of this reiteration? Right? So Damu's exploits in the freedom struggle is retold and even within chapter 11 you can see multiple narratives which comment on which try to recapture how the events unfolded right so if you look at page 152 the paragraph which begins as the crowd that gathered around the clock tower junction saw what happened next that paragraph alone has several strands some conflicting the thread the story thread that has gone before so uh, what is the point of such retellings and and Saur was pointing about um, pointing about the issue of gossip right so uh, what is gossip what is exaggeration what is reality gets muddied up in these multiple narratives right and that also reminds me of the chatter of the young college going lads um, who talk about a sick um, film star and whether she recovered or not so you can see how um, different trajectories confuse the plot of a particular event right um, so we need to keep that in mind so uh, I'm, I'm just going to read a, a point here and there some people say they saw him pick it back up so that he could wrap it around his head as he crawled slowly down the paved road coughing up blood but that truly is an exaggeration right so uh, some people say this but that's an exaggeration that's not the truth uh, and, and this is what the narrator says and I want to go back to that previous point, um, 152, when a police superintendent tells you to remove your turban, it takes a different sort of man to refuse to take it off and fold it under his arm. It is not as though the deputy told him to cut his own throat. How do you understand this? Okay. It takes a different sort of man to refuse that order, right? It takes perhaps a very courageous man to refuse that order and then what about that last remark thrown in by the narrator it is not as though the deputy told him to cut his own throat so I want you to think about that statement and and try to understand the point of view that the narrator is trying to make and we need to realize that Damu is this one big shining example for the freedom fighter Right? We have the press being represented by this complicated Machiavellian Isaki. Right? We have um, the municipal president being represented by Joseph. We have tradespeople. Right? Uh, we have a trade unionist on the part of um, Janardhanam. Right? So we have figures representing different institutions in uh, this particular novel. And you want to think about how good are they representing that institution. And again, I also want you to think about how the institution of marriage is represented as well, right? You can see the slant of the narrative coming in on page um, 155. Friends cheered him on, convinced that his speech that they had taken everyone by storm, Damu's speech. He had gone a little bit over the top, but it had been so long since he had thundered away like that. There was no real need for instance to have touched on the scavenger's grievances. Nevertheless, he declared that if the municipality uh, continued to antagonize the scavengers and so on and so forth, uh, the emphasis here is there was no real need for instance to, ha to have touched on the scavenger's grievances. So you can see the narrator trying to intervene with his commentary on the state of affairs picked up by Damu, right? So we do get his slant in the narrative. Page 156, 
But when he was suddenly arrested one day, people treated him like a hero for exposing the black market. His celebrity grew and his friends whispered criticism ground to a halt. He is doing this exposure because of personal reasons, because of personal rivalry. But the people kind of exaggerate his interventions and treat him as a hero who has done something for the society. Right? So he, he is kind of, um, his image is associated with the previous image of freedom fighting. Right? So you can see how, what kind of role exaggeration plays in creating the celebrity cult. One moment somebody is celebrated, the next moment that um, celebration is uh, uh, destroyed. Chapter 12, Isaki is the hero of this chapter or the anti-hero. Right? He is very clever, he is stagey, uh, he is manipulative and the sole purpose um, of Isaki's visit to Abdul Qadir is to make sure that Abdul Qadir participates in the election for the 13th ward so that Damu will lose. Right? And Isaki is doing this perhaps on the insistence of the municipal president right or Isaki is doing this perhaps he wants to cut Damu down to size right so there are several acts to grind on the part of Isaki you can't pin uh, one uh, reason down as the uh, motive for Isaki encouraging Kadir to participate there are several things personal right and and social as well Damu is growing in stature Right, Damu is growing in stature because he was the Beetle Merchants Association's president and then he has got the cigarette agency and now he is running for elections. He is on the side of the scavengers and that is kind of shaking up the societal order. Right? So things are spiraling out of control and they are worried that uh, some lowborn or some figure who is not suitable for that position may become the president of the municipality. So the press steps in. The press in the guise of Isaki steps in. He could have been encouraged by Joseph, um, but it's his word. Right? It's his word. And, and um, the fact that he's related to uh, the owner of the press is also, um, ca also cannot be confirmed. Right? It, it, there's a lot of uh, exaggerated narratives uh, uh, floating about in the world of Tamaran history. Right. So um, it's a very, very complex chapter. The way, um, you know, Isaki maneuvers, you know, uh, elbows into uh, the good books of Abdul Qadir. Right. So it's a fantastic chapter. And, and there are examples of free indirect discourse, page 158, page 158. They would never actually be able to see it since it was sure to be banned the moment it was printed there was no question it would make the front page in the newspapers and raise real debate in the courtroom about artistic freedom it would be a terrible headache for the authorities a terrible headache for the politicians but there was no avoiding it what is this it it is the magnum opus of isaki right and you can see how the narrator is internalizing or focalizing on um, on Isaki as uh, his um, publications are talked about right so we have uh, an example of a fantastic uh, example of free indirect discourse there it cannot be called a gun if it only fires cotton from its muzzle and then um, further down on the same page we have a a remarkable physical description of Isaki. We don't get uh, a lot of physical descriptions of characters in this uh, novel, but we do get a, a, a detailed one of Isaki, and, and you can see how harsh that description is. It's almost a caricature. There's a lot of sarcasm, uh, and you can see the slant of the narrator through that physical description of Isaki, right? He says, more often than not, they were squinting. His eyes were squinting as though someone had taken a chisel and gouged out a line where his eyes should have been, as if somebody has kind of sculpted a line instead of, you know, eyes. They disappeared completely when he laughed. Since he was a man who laughed all the time, both genuinely and in pretense, the times when his eyes were actually visible are were rare moments indeed, right? So he laughs quite a bit um, 
and 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 he laughs um you know he pretends to laugh there's pretense as well hypocrisy as well so it's a very very um sarcastic portrait of isaki that you get the other interesting thing about the novel is that um, people easily spot craftiness strategies the schemes of the other right they just you know uh, take a minute um, just a minute and then expose it and there is one example of that in page um, 159 160 right when Isaki is uh, trying to make um, money out of a new press in the neighborhood and, and um, Francis kind of easily knows what are the motives behind Isaki's uh, publishing an ad for Francis Press, right? So craftiness schemes are laid bare the moment they are hatched. Conspiracies, conspiracies are easily found out. And then uh, we have the word play uh, highlighted by um, Sauer when he was doing um, his presentation. So the word play is interesting because uh, of two reasons, uh, the translation the, uh, the, the attention to the translation kind of comes to the surface in that particular moment and secondly the emphasis on sexuality talk about sexuality is also illustrated right um, that Kalvi Kalavi is, is it, it makes sense only if you know the Tamil language otherwise it does not make a lot of sense so uh, the translator deliberately stuck to the uh, original Tamil terms to make that point about um, uh, education and sexuality. I would also want you to think about that reference to the old widow uh, a subject brought up, uh, brought up by that bookkeeper of Abdul Qadir. That bookkeeper is interesting because he will switch loyalties later on. He will uh, go over to Damu and he will expose some of the uh, information about uh, Qadir. Right? So, uh, that subject of the old widow, the rich old widow, once again is, is, is tied to that um, you know, uh, theme of skewed gender identities uh, which is one of the key subtexts to this novel. Page 167, what kind of man leaves a newspaper and press to that stupid bitch who cleans his house? Again, ties into as I said the lopsided representation of femininity, right? In the same chapter, right, we have uh, an old widow, um, you know, with, with a lot of money who could adopt uh, the bookkeeper and then he kind of longs for that and then a uh, few pages down the line we have uh, somebody who is owning the press because of her uh, influence with the previous owner. Page 169, Kadar looked at Isaki for a minute or so, he saw the face of an innocent child and the face of a master comedian. Right? Both um, the innocent child and the master comedian are acts that he puts on for the benefit of Abdul Qadir so that you know he can be influenced uh, into participating in uh, the election. The most important section in um, this chapter is on page 172, how Isaki very casually brings in the idea of chopping the tamarind tree. You know, uh, and you realize that um, doing away with the tamarind tree would metaphorically cut down, cut down the strength of Damo, because they believed that uh, getting rid of the tamarind tree would get rid of the financial pillars of Damo and his family, and that in turn will affect the results of the electoral process, right? So it's you can see how this is connected. The the presence of the tamarind tree is connected to the uh, petty politics of the human beings occupying that space. Right? Uh, it's a very simple logic, but it's a powerful logic. It it picks up. Kader buys that. Right? Isaki says that I'm making sense, brother. I've thought carefully about what I'm saying here. His business has got nothing to do with the stuff he actually sells. You can get the same things in a hundred stores around here. His business is totally due to the shade. 
get rid of the shade and his business will collapse don't doubt it for a second if his business collapses the cigarette agency will just vanish from his clutches his um, wealth will vanish and then he will not have a lot of uh, ground for winning in the municipality elections and the seat of the president will be safe right so uh, lots of things can be sorted out his social climbing as well as the threat to the position of uh, the existing municipal president and um, you can see how Isaki is going to employ his pen to get rid of the tamarind tree right he says, let me get my hand on that cracked pen and have it fill a few pages and pretty soon that tamarind tree will be heading past you in the back of a lorry when you come to open your shop, right? So he kind of um, draws attention to the power of the rhetoric, the power of language. It doesn't have to be a language that captures reality. It just have to be powerful. It just have to win over the minds of the population and you will um, get what you want. Okay, chapter 13 um, in, in sorting out the elections, right? So uh, the public phase of the novel and the private phase, uh, if you try to understand these two kind of trajectories, um, it will make a lot of meaning for you. Okay, now, um, you know, once Kader comes into the fray, you can see how the press takes Damo apart with its editorials. Right? Everybody knew that once Isaki had found a sewer to start ripping open, he wouldn't stop until he had dug as deep and wide as he needed to go. So they had great faith in him. So once again, the election becomes a carnival, a spectacle. Right? And there's another important motive for uh, Isaki in drawing Kader in. Right? It makes the battle more interesting. Isn't it? It makes the battle more interesting, and that would mean a lot of uh, sales for the paper. You can also see how um, the communal politics is exploited in order to uh, split the votes, right? So, uh, that uh, interesting part of uh, the process is laid bare. Now let's talk about Grandpa Peanut. He is a man who sells peanuts outside the uh, mosque and he's very popular with the children. He's a very old man, very poor and he reminds me of that, um, that figure in um, Sundarama Sami's short story, Reflowering that uh, you know he's, he has resemblances to that old man the blind old man with a big family so a similar figure uh, is um, is a grandpa peanut right and once um, he is roped in and that is the strategy of Damu Damu ropes in grandpa peanut to split the votes to take the votes away from Abdul Qadir so instead of having one Islamic figure there are two Islamic figures um, against Damu right so Damu hopes that by splitting the words he will get um, a sizable number of the words which will make him uh, win the election for the 13th ward and the community in that 13th ward start to kind of rally around grandpa peanut because he's such an old man so poor and he's all the time in the sun selling all these peanuts to kids and the women kind of support him wholeheartedly right and you get um uh, lots of comments about that and he also gets a, a cash inflow. Grandpa Peanut gets a ca cash inflow. He's allowed to ride in a car uh, to sign the papers. And as he is going towards the you know, office to sign papers, he gets all the children to ride with him. And he also takes the children of Abdul Qadir to uh, have a ride with him um, in the car. Right? So uh, he's a, a figure who is heartwarming in his generosity. Uh, and uh, Abdul Aziz. The father-in-law of Abdul Qadir comes by to pay him a visit and he asks him to withdraw from the election. Um, so you can see, regardless of the, you know, uh, the severing of the relationship between the father-in-law and the son-in-law, he still has his loyalties um, towards the man who married um, his daughter. So he comes by Aziz's house and asks him to withdraw. And that conversation is pretty interesting. So the general themes of, you know, the rich versus poor, all these uh, emerge. He says, um, the old guy, Peanut, Grandpa Peanut says, 
rich people always stick together. It doesn't matter what caste they are or which god they worship. Anyway, why don't you tell your son-in-law to drop out if you want one of us to win so much? That's what I would say. And the entire neighborhood kind of uh, comes to support him and things get ugly. And uh, there's a lot of screaming of curses and, um, you know, um, Abdul Aziz escapes from that um, really harsh uh, turn of affairs. Chapter 14. The metaphor of war is used to describe the battle between Kadar, Damu, and um, Grandpa Peanut, right? Especially the battle between Kadar and uh, Damu. Hearing the sorts of things they were saying, it seemed as though they had conjured up a war of opposing armies with Kada gaining ground on the battlefield through devilish strength and Damu who up to that point had been leading a tireless offensive now beating a confused retreat after having been put to flight and there is this issue of um, you know having the tree cut and that takes up a lot of uh, the space of conversation among the population and page 185 you can see how Isaki kind of puts up a, a big battle, a, a big show of strength to have the tree removed. And he starts to sketch from the old legends of Chaltai. And, and he also points out that at some point, the British wanted to get rid of the tree, but some corrupt official managed to retain it. So the Tamarin tree once again becomes the focus of the battle between two sections of the population. Damu wanting to have the tree right there, wanting to protect it. And we have the other group, uh, Kadar, wanting to get rid of it. And we have Isaki, the municipal group, with the president at its head, all kind of uh, supporting to have the tree. Uh, destroyed so uh, the last few uh, moments of the novel becomes a story about kind of protecting or uh, rejecting the symbol of tradition right which has been there on the scene for uh, ages together and look at the way uh, the tree is, uh, uh, is, is kind of uh, figuratively portrayed page 187 Kambaramayanam Anandam Pillai, uh, he says that if you really want to wipe the tilak off a married woman's forehead, then go ahead and do it. I just hope that God forgives you, right? So uh, taking the tree away from that landscape is like turning a woman into a widow, right? So that's the analogy of the, of the tree. And there are also lots of, um, you know, reasons put forward by uh, the municipality to uh, get rid of the tree. They say that the best course of action would be to get rid of the tamarind tree so that no such untoward events would occur in the future. Untoward events being um, the, you know, theft of the pots, the smashing of the sign. So everything is kind of connected to the presence of the tree itself, right? The case against um, Damu fails and he is completely cleared of the charges, right? The police are not able to prove the fact that he was the one who instigated the scavengers to thieve uh, the pots as well as to get the uh, sign smashed, right? Page 191, Damu poaches um, the bookkeeper who worked for Abdul Qadir. Abdul Qadir is no longer able to pay him. So um, the bookkeeper switches sides uh, to Damu's mind, page 191, to Damu's mind, bringing in a man who had such long experience managing the accounts of a wholesale cigarette business would be quite a coup. The bookkeeper accepted the offer. And it is the bookkeeper who shows his loyalty, new loyalty to his new master by telling, about, telling him about the reasons for uh, getting rid of the tree the reasons that Kadar and Isaki and everybody come up with for getting rid of the tree and that is to attack the financial capabilities um, of Damu page 194 page 194 and how would a man with no principles know what's offensive here you've got someone involved in the black market who comes up with a scheme to destroy an independent business uh, man and he has found a hack with a pen to promote it but even still where is the law in this country that says a civilized municipality has to go through with it so this set of ideas kind of sums up the nature of the anti damu group right so uh, the anti damu group has l enlisted the help of all these uh, to make sure that he loses uh, the election 
so da Damu kind of very cleverly sees through the plot. Uh, and that ties in with the early point that I made that everybody knows the stratagems of the other. Conspiracies are easily exposed. Right. Page, uh, uh, chapter 15, the last chapter. So what does Damu do to save uh, the last attempt at saving the tamarind tree? They turn the tree into a god. That's, that's uh, Damu's last uh, card that he plays. So what they do is overnight they uh, kind of remove a bark from the tree and embed the face of a, uh, an idol, a female goddess onto the tree and the whole place is transformed into a kind of a sacred site. It becomes a carnival. People come by swamis and all the rishis and then there are musicians, troops of musicians and, and different kinds of regional artists kind of descend on the place to make sure that nobody is sent over uh, to cut down the tree. In fact, the place becomes so crowded and so clogged with people that um, buses have to be uh, rerouted, right? The traffic has to be rerouted um, and, and nobody can arrive at the place who can, um, who can destroy um, the tamarind tree. So I'm going to read that section because it's pretty exciting uh, to read it. You, you get a sense of the resurgence you know, the resurgence of tradition to safeguard itself against the onslaught of corruption, right? Corruption, progress, and, and other kinds of factors which is, um, you know, antithetical to um, principles of the past, right? Page 197, a goddess festival was in full swing in front of the tamarind tree, a goddess festival, right? Saffron was smeared thickly on her forehead, right? The forehead of the goddess, and green stones sparkled in her eyes. The sunlight glinting off them in sparkling busts. All over the junction, the air was heavy with the sweet smell of incense. Right? Everyone there had stripes of sandal paste on their foreheads. It seemed as though the face of every pious Hindu in town had converged for this one event. The number of beards in the crowd was impossible to miss. Right? They belonged to well-known swamis who led garlanded devotees up through the mountains on the Ayyappan pilgrimage. And there are other stellar figures, stellar religious figures. People were having a great time laughing about how the man who had been hired to cut down the tamarind tree was now heading back home, having sent notice to the municipality that there was no way he was going to cut the tree down. Now, he can't even get at the tree because of the religious crowd thronging around the tree. Right? So it's a master strategy pulled off by Damu at the last minute to save um, the tamarind tree. And then something very, very uh, shocking happens, uh, something unexpected happens, which is that the body of Kuli Ayyappan, the dead body of Kuli Ayyappan is found near the tamarind tree. In fact, somebody said that he was uh, stabbed uh, very grievously and then he was taken away by the people to the hospital where he confesses and dies. So what is this story about Kuli Ayyappan? So we have a kind of a flashback, right? And what is this flashback about? So Kuli Ayyappan is in the pay of Damu. He has been regularly getting money from Damu and um, Damu used to give him money so that, you know, he doesn't kind of affect the court case which was ongoing about the smashing of the sign. So once the case is closed, you know, with, with uh, no harm to Damu, we have Kuli Ayyappan regularly visiting Damu again to extort money from him. So, you know, Damu obviously gets fed up and he says, I'm not going to give you any more money, right? At one point he refuses him and at that point he turns to Abdul Qadir his old master, right? So what he does is he tells Khadr that he can destroy the tamarind tree secretly. He can murder the tamarind tree secretly. And he does that. He gets hold of some mercury and some poison, mixes it up, stabs the tree, um, you know, pours poison into the tree, covers up the uh, hole that he punctures into the tree. And when he's in the act of doing it, uh, some of the supporters of Damu, who has been, who have been kind of, you know, participating in the election campaign, notices him uh, in the middle of the night, climbing down from the tree, and they attack him with a uh, knife, and that's why he has been killed, right? So they try to save the tree, 
doctors are called in, uh, tree physicians are called in and they try to save the tree but to no effect. All the leaves from the tree wither and soon it has completely shed all its leaves and it is declared as dead. So the place turns into a kind of a graveyard with all the shops kind of um, you know shutting up because the crowd moves away from that place and um, that's the kind of history that um, this young narrator is trying to sketch. Let me read some uh, excerpts to give you a sense uh, of the tragedy that kind of befalls on the community um, where the tamarind uh, tree once stood. 205, it was no longer a tree, no longer a god, just a corpse. It was the time of year when the summer wind had started to blow. The tamarind tree danced pointlessly in the breeze, a life that had slipped away. It was painful to watch. The tree looked revolting. The tree looked revolting. Revolting is a very interesting uh, word to use there. Page uh, 207. The axe bit into the trunk of the tamarind tree. So somebody eventually comes to kind of cut away, cut off the dead tree and take it away. If you really want to wipe the tilak off a married woman's forehead, then go ahead and do it. I just hope that God forgives you. Kambaramayanam Anandam Pillai told the town council. Yet for everyone who saw the tamarind tree standing there at the crossroads, even if it was only once in their lives, it is clear that there is nothing but ruin there now and the vacant crossroads look like a lonely widow. So even if the tree is no longer there, the name sticks. The name to that place uh, sticks. That habit is the only memorial to the life of the tamarind tree. Even though the form is gone, the name, it would seem, will never be destroyed. And very interestingly, the novel ends with Grandpa Peanut, right? Gradually, um, the cash inflow stops, right? The flow of cash into his family stops. Even though he has won the election, um, his clothes become ragged again. Uh, he's not able to wear uh, fancy clothes. He no longer rides in a car. And then there comes a point that he has to sell all the pants that he bought with the money that he was offered by other groups and he returns outside of the mosque selling peanuts again. So it's, it's, a, it's a reversal, it's a back to his original position, right? So he goes back and opens the, um, you know, snack box, I mean the, the candy box that he uses to sell, right? And uh, all the children gather around him and, um, you know, there's, there's joy in their welcome. Grandpa Peanut looked blankly at the children's faces. His face broke into a smile. His eyes welled up with tears, right? We have um, Damu moving away from the place. We have uh, Abdul Qadir's wife uh, returning back to uh, her father's house, Qadir being arrested, right? Um, so all these things um, kind of indicate that things fall back into their usual positions, right? There, there is a kind of a change, there is a kind of a rise on the part of all these figures, but after all these complications uh, involving um, elections and, uh, and other uh, set of events, things fall back in their regular order, usual order, right? So that's how uh, the novel ends. Hi, uh, so I'll be summarizing chapter 13 of Sundari Ramaswamy's Tamarind History. So, till uh, from chapter 12, we understood that uh, Isaki had conspired with Abdul Ghadar to make him stand in the election against uh, Damu. And chapter 13 deals with the ways in which they are trying to split the vote and canvas people. So, we see that in the beginning of chapter 13, Abdul Ghadar has decided uh, to stand uh, for the pres uh, election uh, for the post of president in the municipal council. So, Travancore Nation uh, publishes an article with Abdul Ghadar's uh, photo in the same size, uh, the text emphasizes that it was in the same size as of Damus. And uh, Ramaswamy writes that uh, everybody praised the paper's objectivity in running the article without any bias. So, 
Uh, but uh, the immediately next sentence says that no one was surprised by the editorial the following day, which attacked Damu mercilessly and asked every self-respecting author in the 13th part to make sure they cast their votes for Kavak. So, it is quite uh, ironical. So, now uh, we are given a full page of uh, description of how the election fever starts and what is happening in the 13th ward. So, we see that there are political rallies, political leaflets being distributed and there are so many speech makers coming in. And uh, Ramaswamy describes these speech makers as uh, workers. So, uh, that is also quite uh, interesting that he calls some miracle workers who seemed capable of talking for hour without once stopping to take a pose. So, then uh, we are given uh, a brief uh, insight into Damu's mind. So, Damu is stunned that all of his calculations are going wrong because uh, he had planned to split the communal votes and earn all the Muslim votes. And uh, but now, since uh, Abdul Qadir is now in the picture, he is afraid that he is going to lose so many of his votes. So, uh, but still, his Muslim friends we are uh, told that they are still giving him his complete support and uh, uh, but they are also not sure that how much of the muslim votes will damo be able to retain because uh, so many of the so many of women's votes are going uh, are going to be lose uh, lost uh, due to communal loyalty so now we uh, now uh, ramsawi tells us that uh, damo's brother uh, Chella Pen and Damu devises a completely new strategy, uh, uh, a novel strategy and uh, so they make uh, a person who is from the Muslim community who sells peanuts in front of the madrasa a candidate. So, uh, we see that uh, this person who is living in kind of object poverty is uh, given new dress and he is taken in a car to the uh, election office. and. He signs up for uh, the election, standing for the uh, for the post of president. So now we have three people competing: uh, Damu, uh, the grandpa peanut, as this person is called, and Khadar. So Damu's plan is to split the uh, community votes so that uh, Damu can win. So now we see that uh, 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 this is quite. Uh, Brilliant actually, because uh, the uh, Damu and his brother are targeting the madrasa. So, Grandpa Peanut uh, sells uh, peanuts in front of the madrasa. So, they know that Grandma Peanut has uh, got kind of a stronghold uh, knowing all these people and etc. and having a, a sizable amount of people who will go by him. So, uh, now we see Abdul Qadir's father in law, Aziz, who we come to know. Uh, in chapter 9 and 10. So, Abdul Ghazar, uh, 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 Abdul Ghazar's father in law comes in, comes to uh, the town from wherever he is living and he is afraid that uh, if things go the way Damu th uh, thinks, uh, then Ghazar is going to lose. So, he goes to the uh, uh, place of Grandpa Peanut and tries to convince him to step off the competition. So, but uh, the grandpa peanut is quite uh, bitter because uh, uh, apparently he says that uh, a few years ago uh, your son in law is talking to uh, uh, Aziz, who is uh, Khadar's uh, father in law. So he says that Khadar had once uh, sent his lawyers and sent him a collection notice 10 years for a pair of lungis I owed him. So we see that Khadar's uh, old mischiefs are coming back at him. So, he says, uh, go rip out your tongue and then die. So, he is quite bitter and uh, 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 justifiably quite mad at uh, uh, Aziz for coming into the town. So, now we see Abdul Aziz is being assaulted by uh, everybody in the household and he manages to run away. So, so this is uh, chapter 13. Now, so, it is a brief a snapshot of what is going on during the uh, election, uh, the days which precede the election. So, we will see what happens in the next chapter later.
chapter 14 picks up from where chapter 13 left off and talks about how the decision to cut the tamarind tree was passed by the council and the previous chapter dealt with how Damu reacted to Khadr's, strategy, to Khadr's strategies and this one deals with uh, how Khadr uh, puts into place his own machinations for success. So Isaki's plan to mobilize the town, so to speak, in favor of cutting the tamarind tree works and his paper, The Travancore Nason, sells a lot of copies on account of this. And Isaki digs up old stories, old legends about the tamarind tree, forgotten histories, and manages to make a case for why the tamarind tree should be cut. Uh, Khadr is thrilled about this because uh, Isaki does this in a very clever way. He mobilizes support by using people who write letters to the editor, by uh, taking very commonplace concerns such as how the tamarind tree cuts off elect the branches of the tamarind tree cut off electricity every time they touch wires and, and he puts in place very uh, practical reasons for why the tree should be cut. He doesn't appeal much to emotion. But uh, the opposition to this is that the tamarind tree has been a central part of town and you see Kambarama and Ananda Pillai saying that it's, uh, it's always been part of town, it's tradition, you cannot cut it down, it's a holy place and so on. Kadir is extremely delighted about this because he sees Damu losing ground and he also sees Damu being worried because Damu doesn't know why Kadir wants the tree to be cut but all he knows that Khadr, all he knows is that Khadr wants it to be so and that is enough to worry him. Uh, while Khadr is, uh, is ecstatic that uh, the tree is, is going to be cut down, it's because he's losing ground, it's, it's because that he was losing ground until, the, until this decision came through in the local election because uh, amongst the voters, amongst the Muslim voters, Grandpa Peanut was more popular than Khadur was. And Grandpa Peanut had sympathy because he was an old man who'd had a hard life while Khadur was seen as young and scheming. Uh, now, Khadir is fairly confident that he's going to win and this worries Damu and Damu poaches Khadir's bookkeeper and offers him a higher salary because Khadir is so immersed with the election and his, uh, his coalesced hatred against Damu that he lets his business slip and his business starts to fail. Uh, which means that he doesn't have stock, he doesn't have many customers and the people who work for him start to slip away one by one. The bookkeeper is the last man to leave and he goes over to Damu's side. And the bookkeeper is, I suppose, practically very mm, eager to show Damu that he's on his side and that he has no more loyalties left to Khadr. So he uh, tells Damu and Chelapan and the rest of Damu's coterie the reason why Khadr is so anxious to have the tree cut. It's because Khadr believes that if the tamarind tree goes, then the shade goes, and so will the people who loiter in the shade, and hence they won't stop by Damu's store anymore. Uh, we don't see Damu's reaction to this. But we do get the sense that you know, he, he's plotting something with uh, the bookkeeper and with the rest of his gang as has been going on throughout the book. Mm -hmm. It is then that Damu comes up with uh, a resolution saying that the tamarind tree is sacred and that it's, it holds a huge place in the sentiments of the Hindus and that it should not be cut and they take it to the council where uh, Joseph, MC Joseph, the head of the council, says that it's not possible because the motion to cut the tree was passed by the council which is mainly composed of a majority of Hindus and this devolves into a religious argument where MC Joseph backs out and Damu and Anandan Pillai who is also a strong supporter of uh, letting the tree stay as a religious and sacred symbol walk away. And this is where chapter 14 ends with uh, you can you can sense the religious tension and it moves on to chapter 15 which is the last chapter in the book and chapter 15 begins with uh, a sort of past reference and you can uh, you, you, you sort of get the sense that the tamarind tree has been cut and 
It says that the tree was discussed as if it were a family affair. So it's on everybody's lips, it's in everybody's minds, and everyone's talking only about the tamarind tree. It's a huge deal because the town has coalesced around the tamarind tree, so to speak. Uh, so the, the way that chapter 15 begins is uh, for, uh, is, is, is talking about a chaos that happens around the tamarind tree. And this is when the, and remember that we left off when Damu and Ananda Pillai walked away from the municipal council after having their plea rejected. And I suppose a couple of days later, because he just says one morning, the tamarind tree had become a god. So you see that uh, Damu's strategy is to make the tamarind tree into a god or a goddess, so to speak. And there are eyes and there's the face of a god goddess carved into the tree and everyone's worshipping it. and with a symbol so uh, overtly sacred and religious, they know that the municipality cannot touch the tree without causing a full-scale uproar. And this is quite a clever strategy. And Kadir is deeply, deeply embittered by this because now he does not have the pleasure of, he, he believes he will not have the pleasure of seeing Damu lose. Neither will he have the pleasure of seeing himself win because Grandpa Peanut is more popular amongst the Muslim voters than he is. Uh, with this furor going on, the people who've been assigned the task of cutting the tree can't even make it to the tree, and things are left alone for a few days. But a few days later, the narrator sees that uh, there's another furor around the tamarind tree, and this time it's because Ayyip, uh, Kuli Ayyappan has been found dead there, and it seems that he's been stabbed. Uh, this causes more uproar because Kuli Ayyappan, as we saw somewhere in the previous chapters, had been missing. He had absconded and nobody had any idea where he'd been. And now he turns up and he's dead. And uh, the backstory to Kuli Ayyappan is, is now given, which is that when he fled, he was harbored by Khadur for a while and then he was harbored by Damu. But then Damu decided that he couldn't put up with him any longer, so he sent him away. Except Kuli Ayyappan uh, began to demand money from Damu, which Damu uh, decided it was best to pay in case Kuli Ayyappan damaged his chances in the election of winning, of, of him garnering votes. Uh, this goes on for a while and then Damu uh, decides that he can't uh, play this game any longer and sends him away once and for all, which is when Kuli Ayyappan has gone to Khadr and uh, offers to kill the tamarind tree so that Khadr can uh, maybe not win but have the pleasure of seeing Damu lose because now Ayyappan's motive is revenge against uh, Damu, which Khadr agrees to. So one night Kuli Ayyappan manages to cull out a piece of the tree and pour in some mercury and poison. And it is when he's making his escape from the tree that he's found by three of Damu's men who are enraged and suspect quite rightly that he's doing something to damage the tree. And in the fight that breaks out, uh, Ayyappan ends up dead. Uh, the book then goes on to talk about how the tree is dead and how it's been there for a really long time and how it's witnessed uh, the ups and downs of the town, how it's witnessed the creation of the town. And then it jumps back to the present state of affairs, which is that both Damu and Khadr are arrested. Uh, Khadr is uh, sentenced to a long jail term, which he serves out in Trivandrum. And Damu is released, but has no uh, uh, encouragement or enthusiasm left to continue the election. So he moves with his family back to the town where he came from and sets up a dairy farm. Uh, and, and the tamarind tree is dead, which causes something close to riots. The government imposes a strict curfew. Yeah, and, uh, and this is as close to uh, a huge event that's happening since the independence that you can see in a town of this size, which is really small, which is way down in the south of the country, which is fairly unaffected by the independence movement, apart from its local heroes like Damu. Uh, and, and after all of this, it's, and it, it sort of returns to normal at the end of it. You see that people move on with their lives, that uh, there are outbreaks of violence directed at Kadur's store, at Isaki's office, but neither of them are hurt. But the narrator keeps going forward to say that years later when I come back, I think of the tamarind tree and other people think of the tamarind tree. And we all wonder why it was necessary that the tamarind tree should have been cut. And it seems like a, a, a very nostalgic, not nostalgic, but it seems like a very uh, firm ending. Except 
the narrator then decides to focus on Grandpa Peanut, which I find quite funny, because then they talk about Grandpa Peanut's fortunes and says that the old man doesn't seem to be very concerned about uh, whether the tamarind tree is dead or not, but he does realize that he can capitalize enormously on this, and he goes around to all the to all the voters he knows, saying that look, both of your candidates are corrupt and absolutely should not be in the position of the council, which is why all of you should vote for me. And he does uh, manage to succeed. He wins a lot of votes. He manages to be on the council for a while, and he gets what the author calls a taste of the good life for a while. So his family knows no poverty for a few months. They have all the food they want and all the nice things that they ever wanted. Uh, except this doesn't last for very long because uh, Grandpa Peanut is, as, as one can guess, is not very skilled in politics or in maneuvering. So his wealth fades away as does his position and he goes back to selling sweets and beedies and snacks like a tuck shop outside the madrasa. which. Uh, and, and you see that the children are really glad that Grandpa Peanut's back, that uh, they probably missed him at his usual place in the madrasa, which, and, and, and ending like this gives a sense of how cyclical things are. So it's not a very teleological narrative that Sundra Ramswami has written. Uh, it seems to be cyclical in the sense that she shows how normalcy of sorts or a new normalcy is established at the end of each event that is a major up or a major down in the life of the town or in the lives of individuals. That's the end of the book. Some more comments. Um, this is a very difficult book because it has um, a whole host of details um, and I would suggest another re-reading of the novel to get at all the details. Um, sometimes you think the wife is dead, but she's not dead. She has just gone home to Ceylon, maybe, as happens with the case of the press owner, right? In her absence, we have the cleaning lady occupying the shoes, shoes of the wife, right? So all these details as to what happens, right, must be understood to get a full picture so that you can make broad comments on the novel. So do reread the novel to get a sense of the canvas right it's a very harsh novel um, it's a very bleak novel um, it gives a really really harsh portrait uh, of the society after the independence in the run-up to and after the independence there are plenty of betrayals there are plenty of bet betrayals um, broken loyalties right failure in trade is a common theme Right? We have the rise of um, Gabbala Ayer and then his fall. We have the rise of Abdul Qadha, his fall. The rise of Damu, his fall. Right? The rise of Grandpa Peanut, very briefly, and his fall. Right? So, um, Shweta's uh, point is reasonable. It, it, is, uh, it, it, it is valid. that it, it kind of shows a cyclical um, you know, nature to fortunes. But it also, I would argue, shows that things fall back the usual place and position in this stratified society. There's, there's kind of no um, getting out. Social climbing is not as easy for the uh, participants, right? So um, uh, people who try to climb the ladders are seen as big threats to the, uh, you know, to the positions of uh, the privilege, right? So this uh, novel uh, accommodates the kind of social climbing um, that is uh, undertaken on the part of the underdogs or the oppressed or the uh, underprivileged, right? And it also shows modernity as a failed project, right? We see the loopholes in the way the municipality is run. We see the loopholes in the electoral processes, right? So um, we don't get shining models of modernity. We don't get um, a representation of trade as a, as a kind of a, a free and fair practice, right? So uh, I would say that this representation is one kind of representation of this particular society at that point of time. And this is not the only representation which captures the various strengths 
that we're crisscrossing the society. We do have optimistic um, pictures of modernity. We do have uh, happy domesticities which would have been uh, enjoyed by men and women, um, happy childhoods, right? We would have enjoyed uh, the progress of modernity, but that picture is not represented here. That is not captured. So the point I'm trying to make is um, just as Damu wanted his moment in the shining lights, just as Janardhanam wanted his moment in the shining lights of uh, adulation, we also see the narrator trying to get his moment, um, you know, and, and he feels cheated when he can't get it, right? Page 135, all this took place soon after India had gained its independence and I was very discouraged by the fact that I had no chance to take part in it, right? He had no chance uh, to shine, right, as a freedom fighter. I'm not certain that this was the only reason, but my friends and I followed everything about Damu's case with passionate interest, right? They have no larger social goal, right? Therefore, they are diverted by the intricacies of uh, plots, um, you know, uh, hatched by Damu and other figures, right? So, uh, in the lack of a national trajectory which captures the interest of an entire population, small gossip, small conspiracies, conflicts between trading parties uh, captures the imagination of young men such as the narrator, right? So I want you to reread the novel so that you can get um, a great sense of um, this landscape. Now I want to come back to ideas about translation. I have here before me an article called Translation Tensions written by Vimala Rao published in um, I think uh, Indian Literature um, Journal published by the Sahitya Academy. Right. Um, what she says um, about translation in a post-colonial, post-modern, post-structuralist world kind of sums up the various tensions uh, related to this field. She says, um, especially in a post-colonial, post-modern, post-structuralist uh, world, translation has taken on many meanings in different contexts. So the many meanings um, are being listed. The topic is made more difficult because of the belief of some self-conscious regional writers who maintain that the greater the superior quality of the regional work, the harder it is to translate. Right. Um, works that are very hard to translate are fantastic works. It's so raw, it's so connected to the region that it becomes uh, difficult to translate into another language and therefore that work is superior. That's one argument, right? There are others who opine that the regional writer does not need international prominence. He just needs prominence in his own language. There's not even a need to be translated so that others can get a glimpse of the uh, ways of life of a particular region. We don't need to be translated. That's another argument. There are also those who believe that translation is an inferior derivative kind of activity and translators are only blotting papers. We know that argument. Translation is not as good as the original, right? The, the novel in the original is not as good as the one translated by uh, somebody. The claims to superiority of the regional writers and their writings are based on the quality of rootedness of culture and language within the limits of which they operate, right? So the superiority is connected to the kind or the intensity of being connected to the regional soil and regional culture. This limited ground is believed to invest their writing with honesty, originality, authenticity and purity. Right? So all these elements are uh, supposedly uh, found in greater amounts in a regional work which is also not very easy to translate. I, I would say not necessarily, not necessarily um, and, and, and I'm open to other uh, interpretations as well. Translation on the other hand, especially an English translation would only dilute, distort and defeat all these qualities of the original. Right, that's one of the arguments uh, thought to be, uh, you know, valid. Not necessarily. Again, translations are important, significant for multiple reasons. Right, translations are important to um, showcase, to bring into a larger public domain the way of life of a particular region. Right, and I have an example here, quoted by the author. 
she says it was Gayatri Chakravarti's Spivak's English translation of Mahastava Devi's Bengali short stories Breast Giver and Draupadi that brought into focus the inequalities of cultural and gender differences in the colonial society. These things would not have been brought to the surface if not for translations. Right? So uh, translations do a lot of cultural work of recovery of exposure. Right? And there are also uh, issues um, in which translations de deliberately mistranslate. Right? Uh, they deliberately not capture the essence of the original for certain reasons of its own. So that's, that's another aspect. So in her book, Gender and Translation, Sherry Simon, Sherry Simon maintains that just as European colonizers manipulated texts, just as European colonizers manipulated texts in the process of translating in order to control the colonized, through language and culture, a translator with strong attitudes, say against women or women writers, would also manipulate the book, right, uh, that he or she is translating. So uh, there is scope for manipulation, misrepresentation, mistranslation uh, for certain ideological purposes. So that's also another trajectory that you might want to be conscious of, not rendering the uh, essence of the original for purposes of your own right so these are some of the issues um, that are related to the idea of translation okay hybridity hybridity rather than purity is the organizing principle hybridity rather than Purity is the organizing principle, as Salman Rushdie has demonstrated in uh, many of his path-breaking writings. The resulting translated text will be a product of mixed cultures of the source language as well as the target language. So there is hybridization going on because of the process of translation. And as Homi Baba puts it, we should remember that it is the inter that it is the inter, the in-between, the cutting edge of translation and renegotiation, the in-between space that carries the burden of the meaning of culture, right? The negotiation is important in the act of translation. All right, uh, I think with that, I will wind up. I just want to uh, go back to our course contents and see if we have uh, done justice to what we hoped to do over the course um, of this um, regional Indian literatures and translation project, right? So we have tried to look at literary snapshots, right, of Indian histories, folklore, societal structures such as class and gender, right, and the aspirations and struggles of men and women who have lived and lived through the diverse Indian spaces across the length and breadth of the country. We looked at a whole array of men and women represented in literature. Can we uh, look at the list, um, Suma, of the texts? Yeah. So, Tagore's, um, from Tagore's Hunger of Stones um, to Bashir, Satya's Gold from the Grave, Gulzar's The Ravi, Crossing the Ravi, Pritam. So, we, we do remember all these men and women who are caught. We're caught who are caught in the histories of colonization in Hunger of Stones, who are caught in supernatural narratives such as um, Bashir's Blue Light, um, who are caught in the conflicts of partition, who are caught in you know, uh, narratives of folktale and legend. So we tried to see the, the, the logic and the reasons behind that idea of entrapment suffered by men and women. And I think Amrita Pritam's um, story uh, is fantastic in that regard, which shows uh, the capture of a male psyche in the politics of patriarchy as well, right? So um, that's, that's a fantastic story in that regard. And the man who could not sleep uh, talked about, again, social climbing and, and the pitfalls of social climbing. And then um, Cameron history, of course, uh, it gives you a larger conf uh, canvas of the, you know, uh, of the failed projects in the pre, uh, in the post-independence period. We did look at, um, so instead of Jajori, we looked at some of the uh, poems, perspective, mother tongue, Gitanjali. I hope you can recall some of the uh, early lectures that we had for this 
course. What are the most memorable texts that you have read in this one? What comes to mind when you think of regional Indian literatures? I think of Bluebell Wood, you know, um, from Pritam's story. The fact that you're not, that your 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 auditory senses are suppressed at certain pockets in regional landscape. You're you're made not to listen to certain voices as you walk through the landscape of regional literatures. I, I think that's a fantastic metaphor uh, to kind of think back and speculate on the reasons for not listening to various voices that that cry out from these uh, landscapes right so we're trying to kind of go against the grain and capture the various voices right um, the voice of women such as Guleri Guleri we don't we don't hear her so much Right? We don't hear um, uh, her so much, but we, we kind of recreate what would be her uh, you know, uh, desires and demands and cries as, as, he kind, as she kind of goes through a painful uh, process of uh, self-elimination. Right? So uh, go for the unheard voices. And in fact, even a course such as this, Regional Indian Literatures, is a, is a course um, which is going against the canonical grain right uh, Indian literature is is the canon that that course is the canon so this is speaking to the canon regional Indian literature is speaking to the canon saying that yes we have other voices which need to be heard and talked about and and discussed right and we sometimes don't even realize that some of the uh, you know landmark texts are translated texts as well so go look for different translations and find out what the differences are right any any other um, responses to the course? What are some of the major preoccupations of the text? The major preoccupation, the one major preoccupation which can tie up all the text. Obsession with the female gender can tie up every text almost listed on the course, right? Um, sometimes the obsession may not be overt, it will be subtle, but the presence, the presence of the presence of conflicting versions of femininity would neatly tie up all these texts. The unreliability of narratives as well. The postmodern unreliability of narratives, which comes up in from Tagore to uh, Carnard to uh, Tamarind history, the role of multiple uh, narratives, which kind of defeat that one overarching grand narrative offering a particular point of view on anything, right? It's deeply post structuralist in the sense that we are going for the marginalized voices. Right? So, that in itself is a post structuralist tendency to capture the less heard of, right? The post colonial baggage is, is pretty clear in Tamarind history as well, because we have an entire uh, population of young men who do not know what project to embark on once the independence is over, right? So, uh, and, and, and the vestiges of feudalism also kind of confuse the scenes. The scenes. Right? They don't know which path would be an ideal path to pick up. And Gopala Ayer is a, is a fantastic representative of that confusion right? as to what is the best possible profession that he could um, continue to uh, occupy himself with. So this, this course has a lot of uh, material, there's God's plenty. The thing is you need to invest a lot of time with the details of the text and with the uh, help of theoretical lenses, you can see uh, where these texts lead you to. Thank you for your patience, cooperation, it has been a pleasure.